Okay? It's better I do that and you get it from me than to sit there and give you guys anything to do on your own who's going to do it. Well, not everybody, but a lot of you don't. So, when the grades comes for the exam, you're going to see that you're probably went down the letter grade in class. Yeah, no, 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 you know you didn't prepare. Or you would have gotten a better grade. It's no different than anything I've ever done in the past. Not one thing you can do. All right? All right, so here we go. I know. Just, that's why, like, I had hoped that I got a decent, at least a high B. And then there's like, like a B, B plus, 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 B <laughs> Goodbye. I know. I'm out here.
tubular reabsorption, tubular back into blood, a whole different capillary system. <coughs> the kidney is a two capillary system. The glomerulus is the first one, the peritubular capillaries and vasorecta are the second one. And then the last, to put stuff back in the urine that we don't want, we go for blood to tubule again. All right, any questions on the three basic processes? As we go ahead and do So we're at the top of your after class learning outcomes, and here we go. So to get through with filtration, we have to pass through what's called the filtration membrane, and it is three structures. First, the fenestrated, it's a lot of words, glomerular capillary endothelial cells. What kind of tissue is that? What kind of squamous? Simple squamous, it's a capillary. One layer thick, it's not here in the notes, but you're supposed to know what endothelial means. Simple squamous epithelium. It has large pores called fenestrations, but they're not large enough to let cells, cell fragments, platelets, and large proteins. They do not get filtered. They stay right where they're supposed to. Then after that, because we're trying to get into the tubule, we're trying to do blood to tubule, we then pass through extracellular matrix. And the extracellular matrix is a gel, and it has collagen fibers to act as a sieve. What does that mean? Strainer, yeah, that's exactly right. A mesh, fine mesh strainer for things passing through. Okay, collagen fibers. So if a plasma protein got through a fenestration, it can't get through that. Then the last layer is just like any membrane, and here is the filtration membrane. It's a two layer. There's a visceral layer and a parietal layer, maybe not the capsule. The visceral layer covers the capillaries, and they're called codocytes, special cells, and they form filtration slits, a little larger openings, but They've been blocked coming through the first, but it still will allow lots of fluid to come through. And we'll get to how much shortly. All right, and then as a whole, we never want albumin to come through. Albumin needs to stay in the blood because it contributes to osmotic pressure. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, so. Here is the figure that was part of the four class learning outcomes, the parts of the renal core puzzle. We have the proximal tubule, into which we'll end it, but it starts with the afferent arterial, the glomerular restructures, the filtration membrane here, then the efferent, and then the efferent will end up connecting to the peritubular capillaries and basal recta, which will then connect to your venous circulation of your kidneys that was part of your before class learning. Once it filters through here, it will pass into the capsular space and out the proximal tube. Here is a close-up of the filtration membrane. So we took a little slice of the podocyte and the basal lamina and the endothelial cells in the capillary. See how the things are too big to get through the fenestrations, but water and small solutes can, and they will enter the filtrator. All right, what can be in the filtrator? What is smaller than those pores can pass through, plus get through the sieve and the podocytes. So the number one thing that's in your filtrator is what? Water, and we're not talking about urine. I'm talking about filtrating. Urine is what comes out your urethra and you put it in the toilet. Filtrate is different. Everybody hear me clearly, okay? Because guess what? What are we gonna do with most of the filtrate?
the train. We're going to reabsorb it, which is the next step. Yeah. Oh my God. You would die in a minute if you didn't reabsorb it. And you'll see why in a second. All right. So that was to give you time to write this stuff down. Glucose, amino acids, very small proteins like tripeptides, dipeptides can come through, and uh, some hormones. Then nitrogenous waste are the big thing that we are trying to get rid of, and there are four. Actually, most ammonium ions are converted to urea because this is toxic, this is less toxic and puts it in a form that can float through our body and finally get rid of it in the kidney. But this is pretty toxic. You ever smell ammonia from a toilet bowl? Yeah, you're gonna pass out. Then, remember creatine kinase? We need creatine kinase for ATP in muscle, and as one of its waste products, it's creatinine. And then if we break down the nucleic acids, we get uric acid. So, you're going to tell me in a PRS question where urea and ammonia came from. That's why it says PRS there and I shut up for once. But what percentage of your plasma flowing through your glomeruli actually becomes filtrate and on the order is 20% of your plasma volume goes through and gets filtered? All right, so I gotta move on. <clears throat> All of this is in your book, if you didn't get it. All right, so here's your first PRS question. And I don't understand the Echo 360 because he says it works on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And somebody comes in Tuesday morning before me and does something to the computer. So I'm going to force him to come at the beginning of the class on Tuesday and make sure it's set up right until we even get to the He's going to figure it out. Which of those numbers, put in your notes somewhere, which 
which, and I'll show you how we arrived at it, which of those numbers is how much urine you make? Yeah. So just imagine, put 92 liter bottles of soda on the floor, and that's what your kidneys do in one day. They work really, 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 really hard. They're one of your most hardest working organs of your body. And you pee out a liter and a half. So guess how much you reabsorb? What percentage? You gotta know this too. Well, okay, 90-ish is on, so let's round it. 98.7. Chris said, I don't know how he has a wonderful math mind. Yeah. 99%! You urinate out 1% of what your, your, your uh, kidneys filter. Everybody got those numbers? Okay. How did I come up with it? It's because you've got to know the GFR, which is your next learning outcome. The amount filtrated by both the kidneys in one minute, and it's a number you have to learn, 125 milliliters per minute. That's what you guys have. I don't. Mine is less, unfortunately. I have had it tested. Um, but that's what happens as you get older and you age. It goes down. What does that equal? It equals three liters of plasma 60 times a day. So what's three times 60? 180. That's how we came up with 180 liters. Okay, everybody know these are three numbers you gotta know. The 180 and um, what's the other thing? Because uh, I didn't talk about it in the other class, I'll talk about it again in the next class. All right, how do we filter? We filter pressure. There's no difference than the capillaries in our tissue beds. We have hydrostatic pressure, and we have colloid osmotic pressure. Same as before, you've had all this before, so I'm not spending a lot of time on it, because hopefully you'll remember it. Hydrostatic pressure is similar to blood pressure and pushes things out. Colloid osmotic pressure is the hydrophilic nature of proteins such as albumin, sucking or pulling water back in. Which one wins out? determines which direction the filtrate goes. But I hope you understand that it better go out, because it's got to get from the glomerulus into the tubule. So, when we uh, calculate GFR, it should be a positive number pushing out. Okay? So, one moves it out, which is the hydrostatic pressure, and the colloid osmotic pressure brings it back. Okay. All right, you guys already know those things. And the most common colloid is albumin. All right, so we're going to calculate net, net filtration pressure. And we're going to do that because we need three values. You'll have to do this on the exam, but we're going to do the first normal one. Okay. So the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is equal to the blood pressure but it's about 50 millimeters of mercury. It is higher than the capillary bed. Anybody remember what it was in the capillary bed? 35, yeah. So, because it is higher, we're gonna be able to force things out because it's a higher pressure, and that's good. We're gonna force it through the glomerulus. Then, albumin, still 30, carries the same um, value, and that will be pulling it back in. So 50 out, 30 uh, back in. But because filtrate fills the capsular space, it also creates a hydrostatic pressure there, and that is 10, okay? And I'll show you this and you have to know those normal values because we're going to do a little exercise. All right. Everybody got those? Good. 
All right. That's just a redundancy. I forgot to remove that slide. All right, so there it is. Good. All right, here it is on the figure. The net filtration, I already told you, favors the hydrostatic pressure being greater than the opposing forces. And here is showing you the blood pressure or glomerular hydrostatic pressure is 50 pushing from here into the tubule. Then the glomerular colloid osmotic pressure, 30, pulling it back in. At the same time, we have created a hydrostatic pressure here because of filling this with some filtrate pushing back, but it's only 10. Who can tell me what happened to the capsular osmotic pressure? Why is that not important in this calculation? Besides Eric, who keeps answering everything for you. Why? Absolutely. So Shannon's right. Colonized pressure is due to the presence of proteins. Did anything get filtered into there? The protein stayed where? In the blood. So it should be zero, not important in the calculation because there should not be any proteins there. This is normal conditions. Okay, everybody got that? So you could have put all four things together like the old equation that you already know with tissues, but we don't need to here because it's zero for what's in here. All right, now calculate and tell me what you think the answer should be. And do this in your groups and we'll walk around and don't sit there and think you understand how to do it. If you don't, you raise your hand. That's what we're all here for. Not for you to sit there and go in and in and not do anything right. I want you to do better on this final last exam, your last gas, to get a decent grade in A and B. Yes, if it's positive, at least. All right, so raise your hand. Yeah.
I'll see if they're I've like worked there for like, I don't work there anymore, but I've worked there for like three years. So. Yeah. So. <laughs> You're just like a teacher. <laughs>
Smooth muscle will now relax, increasing blood growth, blood flow through the glomerulus, increasing the GFR. What kind of relationship is that? What's the first word that comes to your mind? If, when you increase uh, blood pressure, you constrict, reducing blood flow and bringing it back to normal. And when you decrease it, you now relax, which is dilate, increasing the GFR towards a normal range. What kind of relationship is that? Inverse, but is it exponential or direct? It's direct. It's a direct relationship. The GFR is directly related to the systemic blood pressure. All right, direct relationship. All right, what do you think? What do you remember about the myogenic mechanism? and it secretes chemicals. And 
and to this day, they are still not sure exactly what chemical is secreted. That's what I learned, and all the latest literature still says that. They have suspicions, but don't know exactly. What it does is it affects the afferent arterial, and I'm going to keep this simple. For the macula densa, it affects the afferent. When we learn about something else, it's going to affect the efferent. But this one affects the afferent to constrict. Then the macula densa inhibits the JG cells to release renin. Renin affects the efferent, and if it has been inhibited, it's now going to dilate. Okay? When that happens, it's brought back to normal. All right. Then, once that's reduced, it switches back and restores the GFR. That now, the filtrate coming through is slowed down, there's less going into the macula densa, and it comes back. The GFR comes back to normal. The opposite. Okay, that occurred with those dark green cells that were part of the distal convoluted tubule of the JG apparatus. All right, any questions on this? Okay, so tell me, what would happen if GFR decreases? The volume of filtrate would now decrease. That would do what to sodium and chloride absorption of the macula densa? Decrease. So now the chemicals would be inhibited and the afferent arterial would dilate. It's just exactly the opposite words. You have to know that. It's not on a slide. Just know for, just put on the side of GFR decreases opposite effects for this pathway. This is happening to you 24 seven, believe me. If you're not drinking, sitting in this room, you're going to blood your uh, uh, urine's going to become more concentrated as it comes through, less fluid because you're going to start hormones, blah, 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 blah. We'll learn all about that. Now, something that else is not part of auto regulation, but it happens if your blood pressure drops. If your blood pressure drops, you ever heard of RAS? Okay, this was an active learning activity and it was a disaster in the 11 a.m. so I wasn't even going to begin it here. You guys are acting like you've never seen this before and I've done it a hundred thousand times. That's an exaggeration. And I apologize for that. But what happens is now the JG cells release renin. Renin then acts as an enzyme to convert angiotensinogen made by the liver, floating around as we speak in all of us, to angiotensin 1. That then has to go to the lungs where ACE is and ACE converts it to angiotensin 2 which is the active molecule. <clears throat> angiotensin 2 has three effects. It's first a vasoconstrictor of the efferent. If we constrict the efferent we're constricting the plug of fluid going in the afferent, in the glomerulus, so if we squeeze and don't allow it to come out, it's going to have more time to filter, and the GFR is going to increase. This is when blood pressure drops. When blood pressure raises, all this shuts down. It's only when it drops that this comes out. It's all inhibited then. The second thing we told you that angiotensin 2 uh, releases aldosterone from where? Thank you, Taylor. You want to tell everybody? Yes, you do. Because it's perfectly right. From the?
stimulates what release? ADH. And where does ADH come from? The opposite. Where does it come from? Yeah, thank you. Posterior pituitary. All right. We ready? Moving on. And all of those things are going to increase blood volume, vasoconstrict, and as negative feedback, raise our blood pressure. All right. Here is the figure. This is so much better. I don't know why she waited until now to actually put it in the book. It would have been nice to have this earlier on. I gave you guys the pathway, but here's the figure with us. There you go. There's the physical. Everything I've talked about. Angiotensin from the liver, renin from the JG cells, converting it to angiotensin 2, which has all these effects. Constricting the efferent arterial to increase the GFR. Vasoconstricting, increasing sodium, water, and water. If we absorb sodium, water, Follows. Okay. Does it have a direct effect on water, aldosterone? No. It's an indirect effect. It will happen because of solute movement and osmosis. Then, last thing, ADH secretion. All right. Oh my God, I'm tired of that. But there's no way we can get into this material unless I do this. You guys are being good sports today. Do you guys know where the factory is that makes nerds? Boone County, and they're looking for 70 employees. So if a and is not here, and <laughs> <laughs> your heads too, yeah. So if a and is isn't here, calling, maybe nerds are. Okay. No, I heard it. Do you know how many jobs are available in this area? A lot. I'm serious. No, please, do something with your A and B degree. Whatever it is. I'm going to call it the A and B degree. Can we really get a certificate? All right, so that's what A and B. How I learned A and B is the exact opposite of aldosterone. So instead of reabsorbing sodium, we're going to lose sodium in the urine because our blood pressure is too high. We stretch the atrial cells in our heart, telling us that our blood pressure is too high and we need to lower it. And we're going to lower it by lowering the blood volume. Water follows that sodium loss. The next one is one of the those. I love that she put it in here because it's something very clinically relevant. When you have patients, you need to make sure they maintain urine output. Otherwise, you're going to go into failure. And you can assist them with that with drugs. For the one, for the sympathetic, this is what you would do normally in your body. You would use norepinephrine. Um, anybody in like clinical medicine, are they still doing dopamine drugs? Yes, good. Because that's what they did during my time. It's a sympathomimetic too, similar to norepinephrine, and you would have to titrate it in really specific doses. This is what you were doing. You were trying to get them to have some kind of urine output. So you would give them low levels. When our body secretes low levels, the JG cells will release renin, even with sympathetic stimulation. Low levels of sympathetic stimulation like me walking around the room. You walking. God, do I always have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the woods when I'm walking? I shouldn't tell you guys this, but it's true. Wait until, wait until you're my age. It's just, that's life. So you learn if you're going on a long walk to not drink. And then by the time you're, di you're done, then you're dizzy and dehydrated, which isn't good either. But, can you see how low levels of sympathetic stimulation, it raises our blood pressure and increases our GFR, just low levels. This is what's happening when most of you exercise.
So with high levels, we get high levels of angiotensin II, constricts both the afferent and efferent, and that's why you tend to not have to go to the bathroom when you're on the treadmill. Which is good, isn't it? Because there's no convenient bathroom or porta potty next to you. All right. So unfortunately, if somebody had really low blood pressure and you were giving them lots of drugs to try to raise it, you risked, you had to be really careful because you risked causing them to go into real failure. All right, so here she has wonderful figures. If this concept is still pretty hard for you, go to, so, so Paige said one person came to her session yesterday. I know, you just had a test. You guys always have an excuse. But you could have gone to learn all about your learning outcomes for today. And then a real pro. But whatever. All right, so what happens? So you guys understand. For the most part, which one is larger, the afferent or the efferent? In the normal glomerulus. Afferent is larger. You're trying to create a plug at the other end to leave time for the filtration to occur. So you're going to have more going in, it will spend some time in the glomerulus, and then you have a narrower drain coming out. So if we want to decrease the uh, glomerular hydrostatic pressure, we constrict here. That will then increase, excuse me, then that will then decrease the GFR. Why? There's less fluid coming in, and look how big the effort is. It's like you've opened up the drain, it's all going to go out, and it's not going to have enough time here. Here, if we constrict the efferent, it's going to back up the filtrate, and you're going to increase the glomerular filtration rate because you're going to have a higher hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus because it can't get out, so it's going to stay there, pushing from here to here. Opposite here, if we dilate here, also we're going to increase here because this is still going to stay smaller, but we're going to be bringing in more. If this is still small, it's going to have more time to spend here, increase, increase. Here, if we dilate here, it's not going to spend enough time filtering. It's going to be able to exit very quickly, and both are going to come in. So you got to think of both. Remember, it's a two-capillary system. This first capillary system is for filtration. The second capillary system is for reabsorption and secretion. Oh, this is one of the things I don't like about the book. The tables. They're just big. With tiny words. But I know one person per class likes it. They just have a visual I can't. But there it is. You can make their cards, okay? Any questions? Alright, I've already talked about real failure some. So here is for your notes, I believe, isn't that the other thing, probably right there, renal failure. So there's acute and chronic. Acute is what happened to the student in the earlier class when he had an acute strep infection. Once it was taken care of, his uh, uh, kidney failure was restored to normal. Chronic is what I saw lots of. And chronic is long-standing. It says three months or more. It can be it can be longer years because don't people have diabetes and hypertension for years? Yeah. And it's a slow, progressive failure. So that's why they need to be monitored, trying to get both of those diseases under control, and then you can lessen when it will occur. It ends up causing uremia because in chronic renal failure or other renal failure, you cannot filter your waste products. What does your body do? Do you have a guess, Phil? What 
system do you think might try that? Do you have any idea, Tom? No, not the but that's a good guess. Not pancreas. <coughs> What's my question? So what organ system, it's a system, takes over? No, that's just an organ. No, it's not liver, it's not lymphatic. It's really, really obvious.
So we can't reabsorb sodium in water, so you lose it in your urine there by red. You ever heard of spironolactone? That's a aldosterone antagonist. Okay, any questions on those? <clears throat> All right, moving on. Let's talk about tubular reabsorption and secretion. First, tubular reabsorption. And you're going to tell me the start of the PRS. What do you think? Processes 
is one mind. So do you. And we're going to get into that in your notes shortly. All right, so here is the slide showing the difference. Here's the two rooms for reabsorption. Reabsorption is paracellular here, transcellular here, secretion is transcellular in the opposite direction. So we reabsorb 99% of everything we filtered into the peritubular capillaries, and if it's still something we don't need, we're going to secrete it back, even if it got reabsorbed. It sounds like a waste, but it's not. I will tell you why as we finish on Tuesday with us. All right, what's the answer to this here?
If all the binding sites in the pumps are filled, we say it's saturated. It cannot do anything more with whatever is going on. All the pumps are being used. Therefore, what it's trying to move in will reach its maximum, transport maximum. And no more solute can come through, get reabsorbed, so unfortunately it stays, or secreted, so unfortunately it stays either in the blood, if the secretion can't occur, or it stays in the filtrate, which is more common. All right. Any questions so far? Uh, yeah, Kevin. We'll be getting to that. Next slide. Okay. I gave you one example. Primary active sodium potassium pump, and then this one, the sodium glucose secondary active transport. The sodium potassium pump is an, this is, maybe this is what you're asking. The sodium potassium pump is an antiport, sodium out, potassium in, right? The sodium glucose pump is simple. They're moving in the same direction. And here they are. Okay. So, first, what is reabsorbed? It says reabsorption and secretion in the proximal tubule, but we're still just talking about reabsorption. <coughs> Big thing are the ions. Sodium, potassium, chloride, sulfate. We end up, I didn't put the percentage up here because I talked about it later, but let's talk about it now. 65% of your sodium chloride is reabsorbed in the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. 65%. 100% of your glucose, amino acids, water soluble vitamins, and lactic acid comes in in the PCT. but don't, don't worry about the amount because I'll talk about it later. Bicarbonate ions get reabsorbed for acid-base homeostasis. And then last, 65% of your water as well as 65% of the sodium chloride. That makes sense to me. Sodium chloride comes in, water follows. By osmosis for fluid. All of this is dependent. First of all, sodium ion can come through through the filament facilitated diffusion or ionic channels. So there can be some that comes in passively. But for the most part, sodium drives most of the active transport, primary and secondary. There are sodium symporters with glucose or amino acids, lactic acid, sulfate, and phosphate ions. All of those would be symport, meaning sodium would move in and the other thing would move in with it. There can be antiports, and the sodium hydrogen ion antiport helps regulate the acidity in urine, which makes sense because it secretes hydrogen ion filtrate. Hydrogen ion gives the acidity to urine. The sodium potassium pump maintains the gradient. Is this answering your question, Kevin? Oh. Mm. Uh, yes, we'll be getting. Yeah, let me. Show, well, there's an answer for it right there. Sodium hydrogen. They move in opposite directions. Okay, here's your next question.
So raise your hand if you have questions. If you have questions, ladies. I can only pretty much call a VC Legal, 
you take a blanket, you fold it carefully, and you have cans of beer in it. And you just carry it in, the blanket. You have a cooler as a decor. And in the cooler, you have ice and a few soft drinks. And they look in that, they don't hear you're holding your blanket. So I got through, and my roommate came next. And right after he got through the line, all the beer started rolling out of his blanket. <laughs> and he's looking around, and I'm looking around, and none of the people watching were looking at him. So we all ran back, grabbed all the beer, and still got in, all the beer. <laughs> but the night, the day before, I was doing a pediatric rotation, and I was exposed to a kid with uh, possible meningococcal meningitis. And you can take a drug called Rifampin right away, which will keep you from getting the disease. But it discolors your urine. And it discolors your urine. I'm flying in here, people, not saying that color. Look how red that is. So, put it on there, took it that night, went to the derby, and of course you're gonna drink beer. And that's a potent diuretic, because it inhibits ADH. I'm telling you trying to make it clinically relevant. So, got up in the morning, went to the bathroom, and my urine was normal. And I thought, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. So I thought, oh, okay, it just looks a little darker and yellow. So we get to the infield, we get inside, and I'm so old, there was no such thing they had not invented porta potties yet. So what they set up, I have no idea what women do. Probably they had curtains with a skull on them. Um, we had troughs. You know what pea troughs look like? Yeah, like giant, huge bowls of water. So, but there are a million, it seemed like a million people down in the infield. And so it got time to go. I held it as long as I could because you can't be pea shot, let me tell you. You walk in there and hundreds of people are right there. So you get up, and I swear, you're given about this much space to go. Because you're like this, trying to go. That's so that's why you have to be desperate. So, I couldn't wait. So I like, well, anyway. So I get up there, and I start to go, and this is what came out my urethra. Pure, and it's running down the drain, I'm like, bleeding to death. And it was like the parting of the right seat. All these guys were looking down and they were looking over at me and they were like, I don't want my hands. And they moved out of the way and then I couldn't wait to do it a second time. So I went back and guess what the same thing out. I was giving all the room in the world to me. Yes, true story.
Yeah, they're all found there. You're not a protein or a cell. Shame on you, you guys aren't listening. Filtrate is not urine. Okay? Filtrate is not urine. Okay, what is this answer? Yep, very good. Yep, very good. Good, you guys are getting it. The next one. Which of those is not correctly labeled? You just look at each one, make sure it's the right name next to the number. Hit your clicker when it's not the right name. Yep, there are two. This should say proximal and this should say visceral layer. And then we'll have to finish the quiz at the beginning of next class because there's a number of questions left. So I'm sorry about that, but yeah, we're going to have to stop that now.